right, in the 2016 cycle, I was a senior advisor on the Bernie Sanders presidential campaign, and as you probably know, was not a typical campaign. The candidate was not just an insurgent, he was a avowed democratic socialist, um, and he started with 3% name recognition. But still, we got to the Democratic National Convention with 46% of the delegates. Now, Bernie didn't win, but according to the conventional wisdom, we never should have gotten that close, right? But hundreds of thousands of people got to work for the Bernie Sanders campaign, and we were able to defy the cynics and the professionals and come shockingly close to a big upset. That was what I call some pretty big organizing. Now, most campaigns, the first step that you take is to hire an expensive consultant. And that consultant identifies a path to victory that goes through the fewest possible voters to get to 50% plus one, right? Campaigns run on money, and in search to get the biggest bang for every dollar that you raise, we've gone from trying to engage as many people as possible to trying to figure out what's the smallest number of people we can talk to uh, and still win. Uh, these campaigns also use a big data approach to divvy up the electorate um, into little slices and giving it tailored messages, which further divides us in a moment when campaigns really should be bringing us together. Now, the Sanders campaign it was really, really different. We had a candidate who had a political analysis, and he wanted to tell everybody about it. He didn't just want to tell a few people about it. He wanted to tell everybody about it. You may have, you may have, heard, this, uh, you may have heard this a few times. We have a rigged economy that's held up by a corrupt political system where Wall Street banks and billionaires can buy elections. Now, at the beginning of the campaign, almost all of our resources were put into bringing this analysis to everybody, but everybody in the first four states. Um, in the primaries. This is the traditional uh, way that presidential primary campaigns are run. But what about the other 46 states in D.C. and some territories where we had hundreds of thousands of people that wanted to get to work for Bernie, but there wouldn't be resources or paid staff in those states until much closer to their primary date? All right, well, that's where my corner of the campaign came in, which was the distributed organizing team. We didn't have a lot of money, but we had a big message, we had an authentic messenger, and we had hundreds and thousands of people who are ready to get to work. Um, so at the heart of this idea, which we call big organizing, is this idea that there's a huge number of people, um, largely untapped, a huge capacity in the grassroots, and these are people who are ready to be called into service. And many of these people, they're willing and able to make big commitments, right? And with the right kind of management and support, their efforts can be scaled in ways that a generation of traditionally trained organizers in the Alinsky tradition with their one-on-ones, their incremental policy goals, and their, and their ladder um, of engagement, you know, could actually uh, never match, right? Because this can scale. So the organizing principles and tactics that we were able to iterate in a short time in a high volume presidential primary campaign, these tactics and principles, they've been tested since the election in advocacy campaigns like you're gonna hear about next, ACLU's people power, and also in down ballot races. And let me tell you, they work. So I'm here to deliver the news that any organizer who's got a big goal, who's got a movement to tap into, and has got a credible plan to win, can use big organizing to achieve astounding results. I'm gonna to talk to you about a few of these principles, and then a way we've been applying it since the election, knock every door. So the first one is this idea, you don't get a revolution if you don't ask for one. People are just waiting to be asked to do something big, to win something big. But on the flip side of this is that people are less likely to want to do something small to win something small. Okay, another thing we learned is that we need solutions as radical as the problems that we face. All right, the challenges before us, they're so extreme that the best way forward is actually to embrace solutions that solve the problem instead of putting at the top of our agenda the first thing we do compromises that merely maintain a status quo where lots of Americans are hurting. Okay, the plan is centralized and the work is distributed. Ezra Levin already told the story. He put a plan up on the internet to resist Trump. People went bananas. Thousands of chapters got formed, all led by volunteers. And here's one that might be like a little bit uh, controversial in this room. Put consumer software at the center. Now, there's amazingly effective uh, and often cheaper low-cost software platforms that hundreds of millions of people are using to do work uh, across space and time. These software platforms work amazingly well for organizing too, and they're built to scale. So tools like Slack and Google Apps, they connect volunteers to work, but also to each other, 
Um, and they have a very low barrier to entry, which means any, almost anyone with access to the internet can actually join a campaign um, or replicate one. Okay, so you might think, well, presidential campaigns are special beasts, and I don't really see how this relates in, in other aspects of, of what we're doing. So let's talk about applying big organizing to what some of us think is one of the biggest challenges that's facing progressive today. And this is the idea that we need to rebuild real relationships with millions of Americans, not just the likely voters um, that are scored on the voter file as reliable Democrats. Um, we need to start talking to everybody because if we're gonna change the direction of our country, we're gonna need to build a majority to do that. I mean, actually, we're gonna have to build a supermajority, right? Because our political system is rigged. Uh, a lot of political professionals, they like to refer to these people that we need to talk to as low information voters, right? And we hear progressives complain that these voters don't vote in their own interest. Well, I wanna challenge us to think about this for a minute and consider that actually a lot of these people have a really sophisticated political analysis, and that is that corporations have captured the system, um, and that there's likely to be little or nothing on the ballot on election day that's going to mean significant improvement in their daily lives. So reaching out to these voters with the kinds of conversations that break through, that's a huge thing to do. Um, but it is something that big organizing makes possible that we can actually persuade and move these people to join a movement for change. All right, so I wanna think about the Women's March. Um, Erica Chenoweth and Jeremy Pressman published something in the Washington Post and they counted the number of people that attended the 653 Women's Marches in the US and they come up with 4.1 million. Uh, they also point out that's twice as many people that serve in the US Armed Forces, so that's a lot of people. Now if we say that these people engage for an average of four hours a piece, a lot of people did more, a lot of people spent a lot of money, Right? So if we said that they engaged for four hours apiece, that's 16,400,000 hours of political engagement, okay? So if those 16,400,000 hours had been spent knocking on doors, for example, right, um, instead of marching, um, we would have only have had to actually knock on eight doors an hour in order to knock on the door of every household in the United States. All right. Now, of course, this is a silly exercise because there's lots of doors you know, that are miles apart. There's Alaska, right? There's, <laughs> there's gated apartment, you know what I mean, communities where you can't get through the door. A lot of us have been like, our list is behind that gate. I can't get to it. Um, so it's a, silly, it's a silly exercise, but you get the picture, right? And so if we could take mass participation from the realm of marching, right, um, into the work of rebuilding our democracy, a lot of things become possible that we're not even considering right now. Now this is the basic idea that drove a group of uh, Bernie Sanders volunteers and former staffers to create a platform for volunteer-led distributed canvassing, which we called Knock Every Door, all right? Because after the election, it became clear that Democrats had let us down, progressives down, by failing to organize at scale the kind of face-to-face -face conversations between volunteers and voters that could have helped identify and persuade some of the voters that we would have needed to beat Trump. And if we'd actually been talking to voters, instead of simply slicing and dicing them with algorithms, a lot more people would have known how angry so much of the electorate was, right? Um, and in some ways, the way we were aggressively um, targeting segments of voters with different messages, you know, it may have reinforced or even aggravated um, the divisions that we're seeing in the body politic today. Well, there's an obvious way to address these shortcomings, and that would be to start talking to these voters that we either wrote off or took for granted, and after the election, I think the Democratic National Committee should have said, we're gonna go out and knock on every door, but at that time, it didn't have any plans to, and it didn't even have a chair. Um, so um, we need to have a movement that's big and powerful enough to knock on every door, and we can't wait for paid staffers to come and do that. But we're lucky, because a hallmark of the resistance is that people are much more interested in organizing around work and getting to work than they are in so just simply associating with political brands. And many people are realizing that the work we need to do is talk with voters who don't necessarily share our worldview. And if we put radical trust in volunteers, we actually don't have to wait um, for DC to come around to this point of view. Now we built Knock Every Door by linking up consumer software with volunteer teams that were ready to go. When you sign up at Knock Every Door, you get a text message from a volunteer that invites you to a conference call. There, if you attend, experienced volunteers talk to you about canvassing, you can press one to volunteer to host a Canvas, a lot of people do. If you press one, then in the next few days, someone actually calls you up and helps you get an event on the map. We give you coaching, we invite you to debrief calls, we give you tested scripts, you go out. When you collect forms at the door, 
but you actually can scan them with your cell phone and then you email them to us and we do the data entry, which we put in a central database, but we also put into a Google Sheet that we share with you so you can follow up with the people that you've talked to. Now, what makes this work is the fact that we build teams in a specific way. And we don't ask who wants to lead, we ask who wants to get to work. And this brings out a totally different group of people than when you ask for leaders, and these are the kind of people that we need to lead the resistance. Now, Doors Knocked, okay, is this, that resonates with you, right? Doors Knocked, is, it's a sort of a, a vanity metric in many ways, but, but what I'm here to tell you is that these canvassers are having thousands of conversations at the door, and they're collecting verbatims from people. Whether they voted for your candidate or not, they are telling us very relatable stories about their anxieties about the future. And it turns out in this moment that the, that the people that are really being changed by this, a lot of times, is the people that volunteer to canvass, right? Um, and so in the age of Trump, it's become somewhat of a, of a radical act to listen. And listening has a profound effect, not just on the people that are answering the door that we're talking to, but also to the people that are actually doing uh, the listening. And it's this, it's this practice of reciprocity that gives us hope for the future. And if you think that sounds like an impractical thing, listening and reciprocity and, and sort of civic dialogue in the age of Trump, um, here's one thing that we learn every week when we send canvases out, is the last question we ask in our surveys is, would you be willing to talk to another volunteer if someone came to your door to follow up? Um, so would you have this conversation again? And overwhelmingly, they say yes. And as it turns out, whether this person agrees with you or not, um, people are really interested in having a civic back and forth listening conversation um, with a stranger um, who cares enough to start a real uh, conversation. Now, you know, we're not trying to replace the party. Um, and, and, and we need a party apparatus that actually cares what voters think and, and devotes resources to setting up two-way communication channel um, with voters and not just a small part of the electorate. Uh, and there may be new institutions that come up and do this work too. Um, but what I'm here to tell you is that we cannot wait to get started on building a politics that's people-driven, because right now our politics are consultant-driven um, and they need to be people-driven. Um, okay. So we... So we don't, know, we don't know what the future holds, but I really do believe in this moment uh, that people new to politics are making, they're making a huge difference, especially when we get more people in the process and we give them responsibility. I'll share one last uh, slide, um, which is crucial to making organizing efforts like Knock Every Door work. Um, and, it's, and it's that a lot of famous organizers have said, and then also Bernie said this a lot in his stump speech, that you know, the revolution, um, real change never takes place from the top down, it comes from the bottom up. And we say the revolution is not just bottom up, it's also peer to peer. Um, because in big organizing, we have to keep in mind that real change is going to be won through the power of peer to peer organizing to achieve mass participation. And so the real innovation here is not so much to do with technology, but it's about connecting volunteers to each other and then unleashing them on the public. And I think those of us who are in this room should think about that perhaps our biggest contribution that we can make um, is simply to support these volunteers and then to get out of the way.